Good morning, everyone. Um, Sabah Ikea. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Kyle Barry, and I lead the economics team here for WSP in the Middle East. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. What's an economist uh, doing at a fire safety conference? And it's a fair question, but the answer, I believe, is an important one. When we talk about fire safety systems, risk mitigation, prevention, and preparedness, we're also talking about value, about returns on investment, about protecting not only lives, but livelihoods, property, productivity, and investor confidence. So, first of all, a bit about myself. I'm originally from Scotland, and over the past 10 years, I've worked across the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and the Middle East, helping governments and private clients assess infrastructure, navigate economic trade-offs, and define strategic investment priorities. This is what I do. I work at the intersection of policy, planning, and economics, ensuring that investments in things like transport, housing, urban infrastructure, and of course safety, aren't just technically sound, but economically justified. So today, I'll walk you through a case for why preventative fire safety across both design and operational life is one of the smartest investments we can make. Here's the roadmap. So today, I'll talk to you, first of all, about a bit of a shameless plug for WSP. I'll then introduce uh, everyday trade-offs in economics. Then the economic framework around the risk context, the cost of inaction, and of course, the return on investment from prevention. I'll then set out a roadmap to action as part of key messages at the end. So first of all, a bit about WSP. Who are we? Well, we're a global services firm, professional services firm, with 73,000 uh, professionals across 50 countries. We engineer, design, and advise on projects that shape communities. In the Middle East, we operate across six countries and employ more than 3,400 people. At WSP, we support our clients right the way through the built environment process. We start early helping city leaders, regulators, governments, private clients, and asset owners define their goals, assess future trends, and establish the strategic case for investment. That includes policy advisory, cost-benefit analysis, economic modeling, and the types of questions that shape not just what should be built, but where and why. We help also design the infrastructure itself, integrating engineering excellence with environmental performance, and regulatory compliance. Our teams plan, deliver transport infrastructure, water utility networks, urban infrastructure, building systems for a smarter, safer, and more sustainable urban environment. But our, our job doesn't stop just when the building is handed over. Increasingly, our work focuses on helping clients manage operational risks, improve asset resilience, and unearth long-term value. And that's what makes this topic today of fire safety so relevant. Because it's not just about the feature of design and operations. It's a thread that's through the entire life cycle of the built environment. And it's where smart investment at the right time can deliver outsized returns for many years to come. And that's where my team comes in, WSP's economics advisory team. We sit at the intersection of data, development, and decision making. Our job is to help governments, developers, and asset owners Understand not just whether something can be done, but whether it should be done. How much it might cost and save, and what it means for long-term value. We work across the entire life cycle of a project, from early stage planning, envisioning, through to business case development, implementation, and post-delivery post -delivery evaluation. The aim is always the same for me and my team. To ensure that investments are informed, justified, and of course, resilient. You'll see from the slide that we bring together business case development, economic modeling and commercial modeling, forecasting and demographic analysis, socioeconomic and macroeconomic assessment. But crucially for this conference today, we also bring, off uh, bring in advice in trade-off analysis and resilience planning, helping clients think clearly about the cost today versus the benefit for tomorrow. In the context of fire safety, all of this becomes highly relevant because we're not just talking about compliance. 
We're talking about resilience, about life cycle performance, about confidence in the assets that we build, we own, we occupy. And in, the context, I, and in this context, I see fire safety as not just an engineering issue, but as one of the clearest, most overlooked opportunities for economic optimization in our built environment. So, let's dive into a core economic concept of trade-offs. Every day, each of us makes different trade-offs, whether to, um, that's versus speed versus quality, sorry, speed versus uh, safety, quality versus uh, long-term benefits, and short-term versus uh, benefits versus long-term gains. In the built environment, we're doing the same, balancing costs against life cycle risks. Should we upgrade a building systems now, or do we delay and risk larger costs later on? What we often find is that trade-offs around safety are either misunderstood, undervalued, or delayed, until, of course, it's too late. And nowhere that is that truer than now and how we manage fire risk in our built environment. So I'm actually going to bring on a slide here called chocolate croissants, because I realize that an economist standing up at a fire safety conference perhaps isn't the most uh, buzzing of topics, but we'll try and make it interesting. I want to introduce the concept um, of trade-offs in a relatable way. So let me introduce this graph. It's a marginal cost benefit analysis. Now you don't have to all get too excited about this. Um, it's something which economists get really excited about though. This morning I walked past the bakery. I had a choice. The short term benefit of a chocolate croissant or the longer term benefit of feeling a little sharper for this conversation today. We make dozens of these trade-offs every day. What to eat, what to wear, whether to drive or take the metro all of them giving up something to gain something else. As we move along the curve, the marginal benefit flattens, and this is natural. As economists, our job is to try and help identify where we are in this curve. Should I have too many croissants? How many croissants is too, is too much? How much am I willing to spend on those croissants before I start to feel sick? Now, later on in this presentation, what I'll show you is how we then translate that into the built environment. So, the goal is an endless investment. It's smart, optimized investment. One that pays just enough back in sweet chocolate pastry while not overdoing it. So, the problem with delay. One of the biggest challenges we face in virus safety is a tendency to delay investment. It's human nature and it's economic psychology. Prevention costs money now and the benefit may never be visible because if we succeed, then nothing happens. But this thinking misses a crucial point. Where fire safety fails, the costs aren't just financial. They ripple out through business shutdowns and long-term economic impacts. A delayed decision in investment often means more than just a technical remediation. It introduces friction into the whole economic system. Increased premiums, strained reputations, prolonged reoccupancy timelines. This is the hidden ledger of fire risks. These costs rarely show up on a project balance sheet until they do, until a failure forces them all to resurface at once. So let's talk about the state of our built environment, particularly in our region. Across the Gulf, many of our most recognizable districts have assets that predate latest expectations around safety, ESG, and operational performance. While some buildings across our key employment zones remain important contributors to our economies, to community life, to workforce life as well, in some cases they were built to meet a different set of standards. While constant work is underway to resolve this, and I see this as throughout the conversations today, I see this as a critical opportunity. Retrofitting with modern fire suppression, smart detection systems, or more resilient materials isn't just compliance. It's a way to enhance asset value, reduce operating risks, and future-proof the portfolio in a shifting market. Now, this isn't about highlighting vulnerabilities in our system. It's about recognizing we're smart, proactive investment can create value and contribute to economic growth going forward. 
<clears throat> so fires come with significant consequences, as we all know, but they also come with significant economic consequences as well. Not just in terms of property damage, but the wider ripple effects that they create. Now globally, the cost of fire is estimated to cost 1% of global GDP each year. Imagine that, 1% of global GDP each year. It's massive. In the UK, fire-related economic losses are estimated over 12 billion pounds annually. Now, similarly, for businesses, a major fire typically results in upwards of 650,000 pounds in losses. And that's split typically between direct damage and indirect impacts, temporary closures, loss of stock, and of course, operational disruption. While these events are often managed effectively, as will be demonstrated today, the associated disruption to day-to-day -day opportunities, day-to-day -day oper uh, operations, insurance processes, and tenant experience can still be significant. The takeaway here isn't alarmism. It's about recognizing that these risks carry real quantifiable economic impacts. And there's a compelling case for anticipating and mitigating them as early as we can before they escalate into broader economic challenges. So, moving on to the return of in, uh, investment from prevention. This is where the data becomes encouraging, because when done well, prevention is not just a safety measure, it's a value driver. In the Gulf, many new developments include robust fire protection systems, from sprinklers, from sprinklers to suppression, intelligent detection systems, and alarm systems. This is a positive baseline. But the real opportunity, to my mind, lies in the continued investment in maintenance, technology upgrades, targeted investments and retrofits, particularly for, that, for those assets that are 10 to 20 to 30 years old. Recent modeling um, that I've conducted shows that proactive fire safety investments can yield strong global returns. For every one dirham spent globally on preventative systems and maintenance, over four dirhams can be saved in reduced losses, faster recovery, and lower insurance premiums. And this can only go higher. A retrofit package, for example, focusing on uh, updated alarms in a building, let's say, for example, of a 25-story um, commercial building in the early 2000s, with standard systems already in place, an audit might show, for example, gaps in evacuation, signage, outdated alarms, and minimal IoT integration. Now, this isn't my area of expertise, it's your area of expertise. But what, from my research, I've shown is that focusing uh, improvements, and for example, improving emergency response protocols, improving IoT systems, and investing in that signage, perhaps around three to four million dirhams, possibly more depending on the size of the building, can lead to an estimated saving or an outcome that outweighs well beyond 20 million dirhams. Now that's a huge saving, that's that four to one cost-benefit ratio that I've displayed. So even when we're not talking about necessarily brand new systems, the principle holds. Smart investment today avoids disruption and preserves real value within our economy for tomorrow. So, back to my favorite graph. Let's return to that croissant metaphor. The short-term cost of prevention versus the long-term value of preparedness. Investing in safety isn't about over-engineering. It's about smart design. It's about aligning measures with asset strategy. It's about understanding the most valuable return on investment doesn't always come in the form of revenue. It comes in the form of avoided disaster. Another thing to look at is the area between the cost and benefit curves. This represents the net benefit, where the space, the space where smart planning turns into real savings, and that's what we're trying to maximize. So ultimately, as you can see here, the more that we spend on fire uh, prevention and fire safety, the more benefit, of course, we will get. But we, of course, reach a certain point, and as economists, that's where we're trying to determine for you, for our, our clients, where that optimal sweet spot is of investment. And in, region like, in regions like ours here in the UAE, where we have such a fast-paced, high-value economy, high-value assets, dense developments, but also face the risk of extreme heat, 
getting this balance right isn't a theoretical exercise to my mind. It's a strategic necessity. So we've seen this play out around the world, and the message here is simple. Spend a little now, save a lot later. Because the cost of not acting, as the data and examples show, is measured not just in dirhams, but in disruption, displacement, and lost productivity. So finally, a bit of a, a call to action. Let's step back and ask, how do we encourage prevention? How do we go from reactive response to long-term resilience? One way is through regulation. And we have clear global evidence that strong fire codes paired with rigorous enforcement drive better economic outcomes in these areas. In the US, for example, particularly in the states with stronger codes, there's been a steady decline in fire-related incidents over the past 30 years, despite building stocks continuing to grow. And where reg regulation lags, losses spike, insurance costs increase, and investor confidence critically drops, which impacts the economy in the long run. Even from the first half of today's conference, having speaking to some of, spoken to some of you in the room here today, I know that closer to home we're seeing promising shifts, and it's fantastic to see. And I think, to my mind, that builds a much stronger economic base for Dubai, for the UAE, for the Gulf, for the globe. But regulation isn't just the finish line. It needs to be supported by good governance, good data, and of course, to my mind, good economics as well. We need to treat fire safety the way we treat other infrastructure resilience measures, as a key pillar of urban and economic stability. So what do we do with all this? Well, to my mind, I think that we screen and we prioritize. Which buildings are most at risk? Where are the ESG and compliance code gaps? This means using asset level data, age, materials, occupancy, risk history, to stratify buildings and focus investment. We build business cases. Using cost benefit analysis models, life cycle risk assessments, and financial risk tools to quantify not the cost of retrofitting, but the cost of not retrofitting and articulate the value of peace of mind, tenant confidence, and of course, economic resilience. We pilot and scale. I'm not necessarily saying that there has to be a wholesale huge change here. What I am saying is that perhaps we need to start with the district, a few buildings, an incentive scheme that sits on the back of that. Monitor the outcomes, build the proof points. We track return on investment, too often when systems are in place and monitoring tends to stop. I see this across a variety of industries that we work in. Fire safety, to my mind, isn't just a checkbox. It's a regulatory hurdle. Sorry, it's not a regulatory hurdle, I should say. It's a strategic economic lever. It's a way to unlock long-term value, de-risk portfolios, serve communities, and of course, build a stronger community. Let's invest now, let's not invest after the fact. Let's shift our focus from recovery to readiness, from reaction to resilience. Because when we build safer buildings, we build stronger cities. And stronger cities build stronger economies. El Madina, El Kawai, Tabni, Ektazari, Kawai. Shukran, and thank you for listening to me.